What does love uh, do? Because love must do something. Love is not a matter of what we say. It is a matter of what we do. And love without action isn't love at all. Isn't love at all. Uh, so we see here in first, and I'm sorry, in John 3, 16, uh, we see what we have, what God does to demonstrate love. And we see the commandment that he gives us in John 15. But I want to tell you, he goes a little bit deeper into this. We're going to go and give you some more information. Because not only did Jesus do it, but he says, I'm come to be an example for you. So first John 316, he says in the NIV, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Say that again. Because see, at this point, when, when, when uh, John wrote this, again, this is the same John that wrote the gospel. So we see here that he understands even to the full now the extent to which Jesus' love is demonstrated. And he says to them, I need you to understand something that this is not something only uh, for Jesus to do. This is not something only that God does. He says, but we have this commandment as well. He said, let me remind you of something that just as we have received, that's what we ought to do. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And he goes into verse 17, he says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? And so what, what we're dealing with here is he's saying that, listen, when you look at verses 16 and 17, is that it is the full spectrum of love. That love is not just the spiritual aspect, but there's also a natural component. What do you mean? It's not enough for me to say, I love you, I'm going to pray for you. But if I have the natural means to be able to satisfy a need, then I'm going to take care of that naturally as well. See, it's one aspect to say, I'm praying for you. There's another aspect to say, I have something in addition to prayer that I can give you to meet a need. Because as powerful as prayer is, it's not necessarily going to replace a hungry belly. If I'm hungry, don't tell me that you're praying for me. Give me some food. And then pray for me. It, it is it is a both. It is a both. It is not an either or. It is both. And so we got to keep in mind that as believers, we have a responsibility, not even just to the spiritual aspect of a man or a woman, but to the natural part as well. And we've got to make sure that we are connected enough to, to meet those needs. I had used the term uh, earlier that my goal for uh, our church is that we build transformative relationships. Those transformative relationships uh, happen uh, when we take the time to come together, when we take the time to learn from one another, when we make the risk, when we take the risk to be exposed to one another, that we might receive and 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 uh, be vulnerable to one another. Uh, even tonight, we took a risk by putting our Zoom link, you know, on on our YouTube and on our Facebook. And we had a crowd of people that want to come act a fool. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I am willing to take the risk 
of bringing in people, then having to kick them out because they didn't come here to receive the word. Because what if one person does? What if one person comes and their life is changed? That's worth the risk. That is worth the risk. And, and we've got to be in a position where we are risking being vulnerable, that we are risking being close, that we can be touched so that we can touch others, so that we can be affected by the things that affect others and so that we can be in a position to meet those needs. Amen. Any questions or comments? So talk back to me in the comments. If you have ever been in a position where you could help somebody or you were helped by somebody, uh, give me give me a hands up. So, all right. Yeah, Minister Nee said, I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and gave me drink in prison and you visited me. Absolutely. Now, that's uh, that's what Jesus was saying in Matthew 25. But let's bring it to our level. How many of us can say that I was able to help somebody that was in need? How many can say that I was vulnerable and somebody came to my aid? You see, it's easy for us to put it on God. But guess what? God puts it on us. And guess what? There are some things that God is not going to do because he empowers us to do it. He empowers us to do it. So, um, Apostle Mike is the host. Yeah. So he, thank you though. He empowers us to do it. Amen. And I, I could put my hands up as well. I have been grateful enough, uh, uh, you know, to be in a position where people, I could say that people have helped me. And I've also have been great can, can say that I've also been in a position to help others. And it is, and sometimes, you know, that's how life is. Sometimes we're in a position that we can help. Sometimes we're in a position where we need help. But the reality is, are we willing to love God enough to risk being close to somebody else, to love them, to give them what they need, to love them according to the way that God has loved us. Not what's comfortable. Because see, some people can be in the face of adversity and they regress because when we, when we are faced with challenges, oftentimes what we do is we begin to start looking inward and we begin to say, I got to protect me. I got I to worry about me. I got to cover me. But there's a place that we had to grow to where we say, I know God got me and I'm going to risk what's necessary to give you what you need. I'm going to love you the way that he loved me because I recognize that if it had not been for the grace of God, that I would be you. Well, let's be real. I was you. Even when we talked about last week, go back for them. It is the love of God that has to motivate us to go back to a place to a people, to a situation, to an assignment, uh, to face the shame, to face the memories of it, but realizing that I love them more than I was ashamed of being in that situation. I love them more than I'm just glad to be out of a situation. Amen. Marshanique said that she's been, amen, God bless you. And I am so grateful, so grateful um, to, to hear that, Marshanique, and know that we are praying for you. But guess what? It's not enough to pray if you by yourself and you hungry and, and can't nobody get you no food. So I'm so grateful that people that were able to bring food to her and take care of her, uh, that they did that. That's what love does. That's what love does. 
And, and so we're so grateful for that. We've got to be, and listen, for some of us, we're waiting to be the recipients first. But I, I want to encourage you uh, that before even that we're the recipients, we need to focus on being the givers. Let us focus on being the givers. God's going to send the right people at the right time to give us what we need. But I believe that if we take care of our assignment, that God's going to make sure that we're taken care of. I just believe that. I, I don't believe that we have to be so focused on taking care of us where we don't have anything to give to anybody else. There's a purpose why in Ephesians chapter six, when we look at the armor of God, that we see that there was nothing covering your back. Because the armor that was designed to cover your back was your neighbor. It was your brother in arms that shoulder to shoulder, shield to shield. I got your back. I'm watching here. I'm on your left. You're on my right. And together we're going to win this thing. Amen. Let's 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 pause for a minute of prayer, because I recognize that some of the things that happen on. Uh, on uh, on Zoom may have distracted some of you, and um, I'm not going to apologize for that. But at the same time, if we are, if some of you are distracted, let's pray. Lord, we thank you right now for who you are. We appreciate you, Lord God, because you are in control. We thank you right now, and I pray that you would draw our minds back in. Cause us, Lord God, to hear you, to receive from you. We thank you right now, Lord God, for what you are doing, Lord God. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you, Father God, will reign in our thought life, that you, Lord God, would cause us, Lord God, uh, to be motivated uh, not to shrink back, but to be motivated to press ahead, to be motivated to fight against the things that want to cause us to hold our heads down. I pray in the name of Jesus, oh God, that you, Father God, would rule and that you would reign in Jesus' name. And we don't give any room. We don't give any space to any distractions. In Jesus' name, we will remain planted and not scattered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's get back to it. So as, as we're talking about what love does, we see that John 3, 16, what we see there is God is demonstrating his love by giving uh, his, his son gave his own life for whoever would believe. Jesus took a risk, amen, that somebody would see his sacrifice, receive his sacrifice and apply his sacrifice. He took a risk. He died on the cross without the guarantee. Now, get, keep in mind, he did not die for the church. He did not die for the elect. The Bible says it very clearly. I'll put it back up that he died. He came. He loved the world. So he gave that whoever. Who. Ever, whoever, how, regardless of how you are brought up, regardless in whatever condition, regardless of your past, regardless of your present, regardless of your, uh, of, 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 you know, maybe how much you may have said you have sinned or how little, regardless if you were brought up in a different religion of a uh, religion or not, if you were taught a different belief system or not, he died for whoever would believe. That was a risk. And, 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 for, and for those of us in the church that are looking to love in a safe place, I, I don't know if there's any Bible for that. <laughs> but love is a risk because love gives. Love makes us vulnerable. Amen. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the mics are back on, on Zoom for those that had any questions or comments. That would like to share. But I want to challenge you. Do not be afraid of the risk. People are a mess. Amen. People are a mess. All right. Um, people are a mess. But guess what? There was a time where, listen, before Christ, your boy, I was a mess. Can I be real? There was a time after I accepted the Lord. I was still a mess. But Thank God that somebody was willing to take the risk to come after me, to be patient with me, 
to, to, to love me in spite of. We've got to be willing to be vulnerable and to take the risk. Any questions or comments? Amen. All right. So as we see God doing it in John 3.16, uh, we see he doubles down in 1 John 3.16 and, and 17, uh, which I believe, don't read too much into that. I, I believe that was just coincidence that if, in terms of the 3.16 lining up. Uh, that is not just God's responsibility, it's not just Jesus' responsibility, but it's ours as the believers, as, 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 as the church, as those that have faith, as those that have received, freely we have received, we have a responsibility to freely give. And, and so it's so important that we take upon us the responsibility to do what it takes and to love, here it is again, as Christ has loved us. As Christ has loved us. So if ever you're wondering, should I do this? Should I love them more? Have I loved them enough? You need to look back at your own life. How much has God loved me? How many chances has God given me? How patient has he been with me? How faithful has he been to me even when I wasn't faithful? How much did he give to me and I did not reciprocate it? See, the measuring stick and the reciprocation is not necessarily horizontal, but it's vertical. But the way I demonstrate my love to the father is how I give to you, how I'm vulnerable to you, what I risk to you. So I got a question for you because I told you I would have some questions for you. Um, is there a priority in love? To whom should the church prioritize love? Is there a priority? Oh, no worries, y'all good. Is there a priority in love? So if, if I was to ask you, uh, are we supposed to love the world first or unbelievers first? Or do we love the uh, be, uh, fellow believers first? Do we love our family first or do we love uh, a neighbor or a stranger first? Is there a priority in love? And while we're and while you're thinking about that and pondering that question, uh, let me ask you a follow up question. Is there a limit? All right. So Josh said we ought to love. We ought to prioritize our love for God. All right. Minister Denise said the household of faith. Amen. Thank you for your comments. Now, I know that question might have been a little unfair because it almost uh, uh, supposes a scenario. If you had to, if, if two people, you know, uh, had needed to be saved and you can only save one, who do you save? <laughs> and that's an extreme situation, an extreme scenario. Uh, but one of the things that we have to understand is that, uh, Love begins at home and it spreads abroad. Ministry begins at home and it spreads abroad. The family structure is so vital and so important because it's in the family structure uh, that we are uh, that we learn and are demonstrate love. And, and so understand that, and first of all, yes, for, 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 for those of you, yes, the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Absolutely. That's the first commandment. Then love your neighbor as yourself. 
But what I'm supposing to you is, or what I want to convey to you is, is that the way that you accomplish, uh, that there, there, there's a way that you can accomplish the first commandment and how you how you interact with one another. Because some of us, and let's just be real, can say we love God, but can't stand people. We say we love God, but don't want to be fooled with the people that are made in his image. I love God, but um, I'm good by my, can it just be me and you, God? And now listen, it, I'm, I'm not here to bash anybody like that. I'm not here, because listen, Adam was the same way. If you remember when God created Adam, Adam was cool. He had the Garden of Eden. He didn't have to work. He had everything. He had his job. He was naming the animals. Whenever he was hungry, he'd go pluck some fruit. Get, get, you know, get it, get him some plants, whatever he wants to eat. You know, he had his set time where he would talk to the father. You know, they had a personal relationship. And then God changed up and said, you know what? It's not good for you to be by yourself. Let me let me bring you a person. And so when he brings Adam a person, that's when all hell broke loose. Right. Because now this person was tempted. This person made a decision. This person did not even, they didn't even uh, consult with Adam. Well, Adam, you know, you don't want to be speaking with God. Is it all right? This person made their own decision. But now both Adam and Eve are in trouble. And Adam is in trouble because of something that Eve did first and that he took part secondly. And so what did Adam say to God when God said, uh, what's going on, Adam? He said, listen, that person you gave me, the woman you gave me, and a lot of us had that same issue. We had that same prayer to God. Come on, be real with me. Some of us had that same prayer to God. God, I'm cool if it's just me and you. But every time you bring somebody else in our mix, they mess it up. I get in trouble. Something happens. And I'm good, God. Just leave me. Look, can, I, can it just be me and you? But here's the thing. He said, now, you got to be responsible for what you did, Adam. So... You're leaving the Garden of Eden because of what you did, because guess what? Even though uh, Eve made her decisions, she didn't have the power for, over your decision. You made your own decision. And I'm holding you more accountable because I talked to you directly, Adam. So, nope, you can't stay here. But guess what? You can't leave Eve either. Y'all going to stay together, work it out. Have some babies and, and, and figure this thing out. Adam and Eve didn't get a divorce. Adam, you, listen, Adam might have had a big grudge. <laughs> I mean, he was set up for eternity. And the person messed that up. And now they have kids. And now Cain kills Abel. Now listen, okay. Let me, can can I can I put my own thing in here real quick? If I was if I was um, if I was Adam, I'd have been like, see, that's your son. I I I, I would have told Tasha that was your son. That was my son. My son was a good son that knew how to sacrifice. That did what he's supposed to do. That's your son that did that. I mean, this dude had big problems because of people. But here's the thing: as the church. We can't escape people. We can't escape messy people in the church and outside of the church. But that does not give us an excuse not to love. That does not give us an excuse not to risk and not to be vulnerable because our motivations can change because of how we feel. Our motivations can change because of a situation or circumstance that may happen in the context of that relationship. But I love you and my motivation to love you, to release you, has, will not be altered based on your response, based on your actions, based on your language or your decision. But I'm not going to divorce you, my brother. I'm not going to divorce you, my sister. I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to love you because you are my assignment and I'm motivated by his love to release you. All right. That felt real preachy right there. Let me slow down. Any, whew, I felt that right there though. Any questions or comments?
Amen. Any questions or comments? Amen. So, yes, I agree. The first commandment, love the Lord your God. But how we walk that out is by loving and by obeying him, number one. And then a big part is how we treat others in our obedience to other and uh, to him by uh, loving other people and treating other people. Amen. So here's another question I have for you. What is your limit? Do you have, I know we do. Every one of us has a limit. Again, I'm here tonight to challenge that limit because our limits of love, our limits of risk, our limits of vulnerability, our limits of exposure to people are going to be based on our security, based on our confidence, based on uh, uh, who we are and, and our safe place. But what but what about what Christ said again? I'm, I'm referencing John 15, 12 and 13 is our main scripture that we ought to love as I have loved you. Now, now I know this isn't Easter and this isn't an Easter message, but but I, I, I need to paint this picture how this man was beaten with the cat of nine tails, with whips, with chains, and, and that were ripping the flesh off of his back. That that he was that he wasn't fed. They marched around naked from place to place, embarrassed, ridiculed. This is the king of glory. That 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 people were. You know, we're punching him, spitting on him, gambling for his clothes, mocking him openly. To which he said, not a mumbling word. Except when he was on the cross, he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. What is the limit of your love? Where they weren't even seeking forgiveness. They weren't even trying. They weren't even trying to repent. They were in the midst of their actions. And he's still forgiving them. What is the extent of your love? And, and, and I want to challenge that limit. I, I want to challenge your growth in, in the Father that, that you would allow Holy Spirit to push back those limits uh, of love that you have and confined to safe spaces and safe people. I, I want you to push back. I want to challenge you to push back those limits uh, 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 to people and circumstances uh, that may be unfamiliar and uncomfortable. I mean, look, look we experienced it tonight. You know, where it's like, okay, this is what we're dealing with tonight. All right. But there's a response to it. <laughs> there is a response to every attack. There, th listen, there is victory to every battle. There's a carpenter for every home. There's an anointing for every spirit that wants to come against uh, uh, the kingdom of, of heaven. The kingdom of hell won't be, listen, the kingdom of hell will not prevail. That, that, that's why when we go back to Zechariah, you see that the only thing that they can do is, uh, is, is try to distract us. And if we succumb to the distraction, then we become uprooted and scattered. But the devil has no authority here. The kingdom of hell, distractions, sin has no authority here. And when you make that declaration here, when you make that declaration here, when you make that declaration here with your eyes, your ears, your heart, your hands and your feet, when you make that declaration with everything that's a part of you, then you walk in, in victory. I don't care what's going on. Every step is victorious. But we got to push back the limits. Because God is calling us into some uncomfortable places. Uh, God is calling us into some uncomfortable people, some, and, into some inconvenient times. And 
we have got to be a church and a people because I don't I, I'm not just talking to the Carpenters Church because I believe there's some people that are watching me now and on the replay uh, that's not a part of our church, but that can receive this same word that there are that he is calling forth a people uh, that will love him enough to go the distance that will love him enough to do what has to be done because we want to see victory, not just in our house, but in our region, in our cities. And really it comes down to how do I balance loving me and loving others? How do I balance that? How do, how do I balance giving others what they need and making sure I have what I need? Does anybody want, want to venture an answer on that? How do I balance that? Because the reality is, you know, uh, the gospel of LL Cool J, you know, he said it back in the 80s. I need love. You know, listen, we all need love. It's, it's a balance, right? So we got to be able to balance the I need love and the I give love. I, I got to be able to balance that. Because one without the other, that imbalance is going to have me uh, uh, wrecking relationships. But in order for me to have fruitful and productive relationships, there must be balance. So, so how do I do that? So talk back to me in the comments. How do you do that? How do you balance loving others, but also making sure that you have love? Can we demand love of people? And if we don't get it, then that's our, that, that's our key to cut them off, cut them out of our life and go on to the next one. And, and so don't think about this just in the context of husbands and wives or just in a romantic relationship, but as brothers and sisters in Christ, as brothers, as brothers and sisters of humanity, how do we balance that love? What say you? Talk to me. Now, if you're on Zoom, the, the microphones that the speakers are on, so you can talk back to me, uh, unmute your mic, or you can comment in the chat. For those that are on Facebook and YouTube, go ahead and put that in the comments. How do I balance it? What do I do? Now, Minister Denise, are you saying that you don't know how, or are you saying that you don't understand the question? <laughs> I just want to be clear, so, uh, so I, I don't want to make an assumption there. With, uh, with the question marks. Because I think we all recognize that there needs to be a balance. We all recognize, we all need love, but we all have a, a mandate and a commandment according to John 15 and 12 to give love. And, and so I believe that any relationship where there's a gross imbalance, uh, that relationship is an abusive relationship. Whether, you know, and, and I know that abuse, sometimes we see it in the form of emotional abuse. Uh, we see it in the form of physical, verbal abuse, you know, sexual abuse in certain contexts. But, but the premise of abuse is when you are constantly taking from another person without investing in another person. And, and so a healthy relationship is one where there's balance and one where... Uh, where I need love, but I'm also giving love. Okay, she says balance is difficult. Absolutely. Okay, don't know how. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so we have a comment on Zoom. Love people, <laughs> Minister Rakita, love people where they are. So some are closer than others, but I believe we should love, but we should also have boundaries. So... OK, so that is now. Now, OK, now let me make sure I'm clear because and make sure that I'm clear even in my communication. Every relationship is not on the same level. All right. And I think that's what you're saying, Minister Denise, uh, Minister Burkita, is that every relationship is not on. You're not the everybody's not going to be your best friend, because if everybody's your best friend, then nobody's your best friend. I mean, by definition, best means above <laughs> the rest. Right. In comparison to the rest. So I understand that there are levels of relationship. However. 
the, the I, I want to make sure that that we're that we're all staying on the same topic. I need love, and I need to make sure that I give you love. So, regardless of to to Minister Rakita's point, where that person is, I have a responsibility to love that person. How do I do it? Oh, uh, that's dope, Apostle. And I also have a responsibility to receive love. And the thing is, I can't make you love me. So how do I how do I get that balance? All right. So and and I'm, I'm I have not forgotten about you, Minister Denise. We're gonna talk about that. So uh, see, Josh said I feel love is the balance in itself. Selfishly making time to love myself and unselfishly taking time to love others. Not speaking of specific relations, but overall. But no, I actually, and I'm gonna put that up. I think that's very good. I think that that's very good. Uh, there is a selfishness that we should have in our pursuit of God. Because again, I can't make you as another person love me. But what I have to realize, and this is to your point, Minister Denise, the depletion is I've got to I've got to make sure that I have time with the father. I've got to make sure that I listen. Jesus took time. He before every while other people were sleeping, you know, uh, in the old Baptist church, we say he was still away. You know, he will go away by himself before the sun came up and had this time with the father. We see even when the disciples were with him, they said, OK, we're going into Gethsemane. They say, okay, you stay here. I'm going on a little bit further. I, I know that you need me. We're connected. But I need what I need, I can't get from you. What I need, I've got to get it from him. And, and, and because I, I'm convinced that if he, if Jesus would have been having a conversation with Peter, James, and John, and he says, man, the father wants me to sacrifice my life, y'all. He wants me to be crucified on a cross. You know how embarrassing that is? He wants me to die. He wants me to go through all of this. What do you think their advice would have been? Well, we already know Peter's advice was already, nah, Lord, I ain't going to let it happen. I got your back, big homie. I got you, my dude. I'm your ride or die. Now, he actually said that, and Jesus said, dude, back, back. Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. You, ain't even, you, don't, you don't even want that smoke. You don't want that smoke. But but he said, I, what I need, I couldn't even get from the. I had to go to the father. Now, that was Jesus. We are not Jesus. Our step, what we take from this is we have to go to the father also. Uh, so that our, that he feels our well, but that we have got to pray and we've got to allow him to direct us to right relationships. Because a lot of us in the church will go to Jesus and stop there. And then wondering why Jesus keeps sending us to other people. If you remember when Elisha, when Elijah was at the lowest point of his life, what did he do in 1 Kings 19? He went to the cave to meet with God. God didn't say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, Take, take your sandals off, for this is holy ground. Lay your stuff down. Let's have, we're gonna, it's, we're just gonna commune for the rest of your days. No. God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And then he sent him to another person. So here's where the balance comes in. We recognize that, as, as Minister Burkita said, we love people where they are. Number two, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to govern our expectation of people. A lot of times we get hurt. We get um, not just hurt, but we're, we're disappointed. Good evening, Sister Brenda. Because we put more of an expectation on people than they deserve. But if we take away those expectations, if we don't expect anything from people, 
I'm, I'm expecting everything from God, but nothing from you. And what that does is it allows me to give you everything without looking at you waiting for when you're going to reciprocate. I'm giving you my all, not in response to what you have given me, but in response to what he has already given me. So when I recognize all that he has given me, it allows me and it frees me to give to you. But if I have a hundred dollars and you don't have a job, and you wasted the last hundred dollars that somebody gave you. And here you come asking me for a hundred dollars. I'm taking all that into consideration. Well, you don't have a job. You wasted the last hundred dollars. You don't have the means to pay me back. Mm, I think I'm going to keep my hundred dollars because I got things to do. But what the Bible says in this context of love is that we ought to receive freely and give it freely. So in other words, I have it and I'm not worried about if you have the means to repay me. I'm giving it to you because I'm expecting the father to take care of me. So the concept is the same in the context of love. I can give you my all because my expectation is that the father is going to replenish me. The father is going to send the right people to me. Now, here's the thing. When he does, let him. When the father sends the right people to you, you've got to receive them. You see, you can't push the people back. You can't keep, you can't stiff arm them and then be complaining that you're by yourself. You can't push back every person that God has sent to help you and then complain to God that you're alone. Because oftentimes he will send the answer and the resources through other people. Press down, shaking together and running over will men give unto your bosom. Now, that's not just finances. Matter of fact, that scripture in uh, Luke chapter six was not even talking about finances. So this is how we balance. This is how we balance. We give it all away. Regardless, we're without criteria. Regard, we got to take a chance on people. We got to be vulnerable, vulnerable before people. We've got to risk our comfort and our safe place to love people the way that God loves us. And when we do that, that opens up our reservoir so that we can receive all that he has. I promise you that if you are obedient to John 15, 12 and 13, that he will not leave you empty. Because if you are obedient in the commandment to love as he loves. And that you are consistent in your devotion to God, then he will be your source. He will be the one that replenishes you. And he'll send people that have a heart like yours. He will send people that, that are concerned about your future. He will send people that will say, I don't want anything from you, my sister. I just want to pour into you. I don't want anything from you, my brother. I just want to pour into you. Oh, yes, Marshanique, it is challenging. Absolutely. And that's why it takes the Holy Spirit. That's why it takes Holy Spirit. If we can love in our flesh, we don't need him. If we can love in our own capacity, we don't need the word of God. But we can't. So he is. So he is. We can't. So he sent him so that we can. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate excuse eliminator. Everything that we say we cannot do in ourselves. The Bible says we can do all things through Christ. Amen, man. I, I am. Whew. All right. Let's go ahead and, 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 and wind this up. Any, any comments or questions before we get ready to uh, close this down? Amen. So we're talking about tonight the motivation to release. All right. We, we get excited. About lift up your heads because, you know, I'm, I I'm, I'm excited about that. I get excited about God's anointing you. I'm excited about that. I have uh, an assignment. 
I'm excited about we're going to take the city. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, there comes a time when you're on that wall, when you're building that wall, when you're working, that you've got to remind yourself of your motivation. you got to remind yourself of the why you're doing it. you got to remind yourself of what's keeping you, what's fueling you along the journey. Because it is your excitement that motivates you to start a thing, but it has got to be uh, your love and obedience to uh, of God and to God that's going to be your motivation to finish this task. And, and I believe that if we haven't seen it already, that the love of God in our hearts are going to be challenged if they haven't already. I, I believe that in 2020, we were seeing a challenge to the commitment to God. And I believe in this year, we're going to see a challenge to the heart of God. What is our heart toward God? What is our commitment, our compassion? We can't say that we're going after the loss, but don't have any patience, kindness, endurance, faithfulness, long suffering, forgiveness. All right. <laughs> Not keeping a record of wrong for them. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to share this last thing. And then we're going to go ahead and, and, and stop for tonight because it's, it's been a lot. And uh, and I pray that, that you are able to receive this and maybe go back and watch this again and, and get some things that you may have missed. Um, but I, I, I'll, I'll end with this. If love is going to be effective, if it's going to be accurate and if it's going to be authentic, then it must be divorced from emotion. It must be divorced from emotion. You, it, it cannot be your what, what you call love and what the Bible calls love may be two different things. Uh, we, we talked about this before, the four different words in the Greek that make up love, storge, uh, eros, phileo, and agape. Agape has nothing to do with emotion. And, and, and so if your love is based on emotion, how you feel about a person, how you feel about yourself, then it's going to be inaccurate to what the Bible is calling love. It is going it is not going to it's going to be fake and it's going to be ineffective to what God calls love, because this agape love is not tied to how you feel about a person. This agape love is not tied to how you feel about yourself. Agape love does not care if you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Agape love does not care if you've been having a bad day. Agape love does not care what you are going through personally. The, the, the principle of agape love is that it is absolute and it is not conditioned to your circumstances, to your emotions, to people around you, your crowd. And so I want to, again, challenge you in your love walk that when you say you love somebody, that you take your emotions out of it. So and when, you, when you're able to take your emotions out of it, then that means that your response in love does not change based on what another person does, based on what, how another person feels based on what another person says. Because agape love is divorced from emotions. All right, we'll stop right there. Ah, glory to your name, God. We're going to continue on again. Join us this Sunday. Uh, my, my spiritual father is going to be closing out this month uh, on Release the Carpenters. And right after, uh, right after him, during our morning service, we will not have a separate service but as soon as he finishes the uh the word we're gonna have communion uh, uh all together so we want to encourage you to join us uh this sunday morning at 11 also for those that are interested in being a part of our uh under construction class that will be on facebook live sunday morning at 9 15 a.m so we want to encourage you uh to be a part of us pray for us as we pray for you and if the lord says so again we will be back here uh, next Wednesday as up for Bible study. God bless you. And you guys have a great night.